All right, Mary, what's tip number two, please? Well, you'd think I planned this, but actually <laughs> I had planned it, of course. But uh, my second tip is, is focusing on the concepts and the big ideas. And it does link to fewer things in greater depth, I now realise, as I'm talking to you about it. But um, so uh, when we're thinking about teaching stuff to kids that we want them to know, understand and be able to do something with, um, we've got a lot of evidence, I suppose common sense, but it's also from the research as well, that we know more and understand more if we understand the concepts of the big ideas behind what we're learning. Now, um, this is really helpful when we're thinking about teaching a curriculum because the concepts and the big ideas are like the boulders that children are going to encounter across their time in education. Um, would argue from three to 19, the big ideas, assuming they're going to still study it at 19, but you know, that the, the point is they're there all the way through. So things like in history, democracy would be a big idea. They're going to encounter that in lots and lots of different spaces. Um, migration in geography. And so identifying the concepts and the big ideas um, are one route into doing fewer things in greater depth. The reason for this is that, apart from it being intuitive, is there's a lot of research and, and Dan Willingham and Stephen Pinker amongst others um, show that knowledge, new, they're like holding baskets that contain a lot of information. So if I understand a concept or a big idea, it means new knowledge linked to that concept or idea is going to be much stickier. So a quick example from my own field, which is religious education. If I'm teaching, say, in a unit, upper key stage two or lower key stage three um, about Judaism and we're learning about the commandments that the Jewish community expected to take account of. Um, if my pupils and students have not been taught about and understand the underlying concept or big idea there, which is the covenant, the deal or the agreement or the contract between God and the Jewish people. It means those 613 commandments or mitzvah that they've somehow got to take account of. It's just like random stuff that the Jewish people have got to do. <coughs> and um, so but if they understand the, the covenant, it all makes sense it links together and then if later on we're learning um saying christianity and jesus referring himself to as the new covenant that only makes sense if you understand what the original covenant was um in the jewish context because jesus was jewish so there's huge resonance when we uh, identify those concepts and big ideas and the great thing is there's plenty of them but there aren't too many and it's my job as a teacher to identify those and uh, with others when we're doing curriculum planning and see how they plot across across the years. So what would that look like in history, for example, if we're taking the big idea of democracy? Well, in key stage two, pupils are taught about ancient Greece. And I would argue it's not a proper unit unless you've got democracy in there. It's not just making Greek sandals. That's not that's not history. <laughs> that's design technology, if it's even that. Anyway, um, so uh, you know, democracy. So, and then later on, when they're studying another aspect of history, either key stage two or key stage three, say for example, Magna Carta, that's got that's got democracy underpinning it as well. And so, we've got an opportunity there for children to be able to say, "Well, how's our understanding of democracy similar to and different from what we learnt before?" And then it can spill out into citizenship. You know, when we're talking about the elections. Um, and, and all that sort of stuff. And so the big ideas are kind of the building blocks, really, I'm arguing of a curriculum. Steven Pinker goes so far to say that, um, you know, unless we have concepts and big ideas and we're learning new stuff, it's just like unlinked pages on the web. They might as well not exist. So again, this links back to fewer things in greater depth, because instead of just chucking masses of material at children, what I call the curse of content coverage, Jackson pollocking the curriculum and hoping some of it's going to stick. 
I'm going to be very intentional about those big ideas because that's what's going to be really stick. And also they're really juicy. They're really interesting. Now, of course, that then takes us into vocabulary because a lot of those, a lot of those um, concepts, the tier three vocabulary, I mean, all vocabulary is important, but the tier three vocabulary is distinctive in that it's gen, it's the gateway into the individual disciplines. Sometimes they cross over. So you have some similarities across science and geography, for instance. Um, but for the most part, they open the treasures. They're the jewels of the curriculum, which is why we need to pay attention to them, learn a lot about them, get into the etymology of them. And um, so, yeah, so the concepts and the big ideas are a very exciting place, both for us, I think, as teachers, but then for our pupils and students as well. I love this. I love this, Mary. And fair, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly sad. I, I love re reading research when I can get my hands on it. And I, I, I came across um, a big list. I think I'm about 19 of these big ideas for maths because I often think, well, maths doesn't quite fit into this. But you have like the big idea of equivalence in maths. And so there's loads of these. Um, so my question to you is, what what is the most practical way to, to, to use these? Is it the case that you let's say you're introducing a new concept? Do you say to students, OK, look, before we learn this new thing, here's the big idea that it links to that we've encountered in the past. Now let's go deep into this new concept and then kind of zoom back out again and kind of reflect on it. How does it play out best in, in terms of planning and, and, and in the classroom, making the most of these big ideas? Yeah, it's a really important and interesting question. And I think it speaks to um, that inspection question, I don't normally like referencing inspections, but it seems to me this latest framework is pretty sensible. And some of the questions being asked are also pretty sensible as well. And so there's a, quite often the question, why, why are we teaching this? Why now? And that gets us into, well, it, 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 the answer then is one of two things. I'm teaching this for the first time because my pupils have not encountered this before. Right? That I'm very conscious it's going to be built on later. But quite often what we are teaching them is building on what they've learned before. Um, and so uh, that's why it's important to have a, you know, an idea of what, 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 their, what the curriculum looks like, in the headlines of it, you know, ideally across three to 19. It doesn't need to be in detail. But so, for instance, in primary, um, when children are learning about how the uh, changes, you know, lots of changes, uh, geom the geomorphology of, um, of geography, well, in early years, they might have done quite a lot of work on pebbles and puddles and, um, you know, stuff changing and sand and all the rest of it. Um, in Key Stage 1, they might have done some work, you know, looking down into the centre of the earth through a lovely book, um, street beneath my feet something like that and then in key stage two you know how how um rocks and things have changed over time through something like a pebble in my pocket so you know when we're thinking about when we're actually teaching this we can say to children you will have learned about some of this before or i'm teaching you this for the first time because so i can't see where you're from now got to be careful because some kids know some of this stuff outside in any case so I'm teaching this for the first time, and this is what we're going to be learning about. But, you know, at the heart of, you know, formative assessment, informing what I'm going to do next, just checking whether, like touch way, whether children know anything about this already so we can build a conversation around them. So, yes, it's like you've, you've met this before or this is a new thing, and then the headlines of where it might go next. Doesn't mean I've got to be a curriculum expert in phases that I'm not currently teaching in but if we're doing this big idea stuff it's, pre it's really just headline stuff um, so I hope that helped yeah that's absolutely fascinating and just just one final reflection on, on, on from me on this you see this with mathematical problem solving quite a lot when when problems students are you know we all teachers all math teachers want to get kids good at problem solving 
And one way I've done it in the past is you just give kids a load of problems to solve. But the, the thing is that they, they can't see the connections. Whereas within problem solving, you have these big ideas, like a good strategy is to take a complicated problem and reduce it to a simpler problem. Um, another problem solving strategy is to um, look and try and kind of generalize. So you've got your specific solution, try and generalize it. And if you can make explicit these connections, and I think this is where I've gone wrong. It's, it's not these are two completely disconnected problems, but they're not connected necessarily by topic, but they are connected by this big idea that underlines them. And I think I've certainly been guilty of not making that explicit enough to students because it's quite obvious to us. Maybe, you know, we can see yeah. these connections, but, but re it seems to me that the, the making explicit is an important part of this, Mary. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, and we've all done it, made assumptions that children will get what those connections are. And that's where we have to continually move from the expert to the novice lens. You know, we're all relative experts. No one's a complete expert, but as the, as the expert in the room, I've got to continually remind myself, what's it like to encounter some of this for the first time? And then then it becomes natural. Um, but it's hard because a lot of this has gone into our DNA. It's just natural for us as adults. Yeah, but we've been like doing it for quite a long time. <laughs> and our pupils and students won't have done. That's fantastic. Yeah.